So today's lesson is actually part two of a three lesson series with Tracy and Ollie. Tracy is a gentleman who adopted Ollie out of a shelter and had only had him for five days. And he's learning respect in his home. And at the beginning of this lesson, I had just corrected Ollie for the first time and he came back with attitude. What you're also gonna learn is how to create more respect in your space, respect in the work environment with your dog, as well as the hear command. Thank you for joining us. So when we were just teaching him respect to stay off, I was showing you how to give a correction in the side, to touch him in the side, because that would be your bite, to make him stay off. And he had just, with me, kind of came back like, who do you think you are to tell me no? And then when you touched him to disagree with the disrespect of jumping, his tail was down and more respectful. Now I want you to watch, see how the tail is straight up? He's busy watching that person over there, and it's all a posture of, I'm a big dog. Uh, some people would call that, when it's straight up, it's alert, or straight up and stiff and rigid could be called a battle tail. To where that's where you watch for like, if there's gonna be maybe dog aggression or people aggression or anything like that on the other side. And then his tail halfway is relaxed, and then down is either respect or sometimes unsureness, right? So there's different ways to read the dog's behavior, but when I touched him and disagreed with him jumping on me, to create that boundary of respect, and he came back at me and showed aggression, I saw the concern in your face. Like, cause you've never seen him do that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I might be the first person that ever told him off. No. Now, I'm gonna, <laughs> now he backed up and gave up his space out of respect. So that was actually different than the very first time I touched him because he started to go, some people are telling me no for the first time, right? So the next time I'm gonna refrain from my, ha my muscle memory habit, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna have you disagree with it and correct him off of me. You okay? Mm -hmm. Because that's what you're gonna do when people come into your office. I want you to own the room and be like, off. So he'll learn. Now, see, look at all the space he just gave me. That's not fear, that's respect. When he goes to jump on me, as an example, I'm owning my space like a dog would as a leader. Space is a big deal in the dog world. And the reason it's disrespectful for him to jump on me, it's not disrespectful for him to want attention, and it's not wrong for him to want attention, but it is wrong for him to demand it, and it's wrong for him to invade my space without invitation. If I invited him on me, he could be up all in my business, because I invited it, but I didn't invite that. So when people come into your office, I want you as a leader, through conditioning and consistency, if you, when you touch him to disagree with the disrespect and say off, over time, very quickly, when he goes to greet somebody, you can be like off. Even if he's out of your space a little bit and he'll be like, oh, Tracy, Tracy's rules, I'm not gonna jump. I'm not gonna do that. And then you have to tell the human not to engage the dog. Do not talk to him, do not look at him, because if the human is inciting, oh, you're just so cute, they're inviting it, yes. and then that's not fair. Okay. So the human has to do their part, and then you as a leader do your part. But it is your job to educate the human and control the dog. Okay. Look at the respect we have. He's just like a little model citizen now, right? I wish it was that easy, but it isn't. That's just a piece of a, uh, of a very big puzzle. When I touched him and he was aggressive, or show, he didn't try to bite me, but that aggressive err that he came back at me with, and the posture and the stance. If for somebody who's not educated about how dogs talk, they might think, well, why did you make him like that? They would think that disagreeing makes my dog mean. Disagreeing makes my dog aggressive. Well, if you do it the wrong way, yeah, because now they're defensive because you're coming at them aggressively. I did not come at him aggressively. I was calm and assertive and I established a boundary. All right? So it's not that when you disagree in the correct way that it made the dog act like that. It showed you what you really have. So the more we require of the dog, the more you'll see what's really going on with him. And then we work with it. Doesn't mean he's a bad dog. It means that's worked for him. That's dog talk. You throw him in a, with a pack of dogs, they're going to work it all out and figure it out. And he's either going to straighten up and line up or they'll kill him. And that's the dog world. All right? 
you know, and being a little guy, being all big, he might own the whole thing and he might be the leader. Who knows? This dog runs. In fact, you had him out this morning. So you've had him five days. Tell me about when you took him out this morning just to try it. And I'm really glad it worked out in your favor and you were able to contain it. But would you walk me through that real quick? So knowing that we were going to be here today, this morning at four o'clock in the morning, I woke up and I decided to take him out. And I normally have him on, you know, on his harness and this leash. And I, and I live in a cul-de-sac, so it's somewhat, I'll say, control. Um, so I thought, well, I'm just going to try it. And I let him out. I let him out the front door, and he immediately went to the right into the neighbor's yard and kind of started just walking. And then all of a sudden, I couldn't see him. And, I'm like, and I actually said to myself, oh, no. <laughs> and then next thing, he came around, and he was to the middle of the cul-de-sac and was walking through everybody's yard, sniffing everything. And I quietly walked over to the sidewalk to intercept him and he walked up to one of the neighbors front door don't know why but he wanted into that house and i grabbed him up and at that point i went that will i will never do that again okay good well i'm glad it turned out well because you said he's strong. a runner yeah. no it's it's, it's learning yes. it's like you know you don't know what you don't know and um i'm just glad it turned out well so this is the deal Anytime you're dealing with a hear command. So a lot of times when you're dealing with a puppy that's less than four months old, it's very age appropriate or even six months. There's, you know, you can, you can try to use food. All right. So my experience using food, number one, it's a tool. It doesn't mean it's good or it's bad. Just like any tool. It depends on the person behind it and how it's being applied. If you're going to have a positive or a negative outcome. Right. And so, but certain tools will get you certain results. And if you're using food as your reward, like right now in your backyard, once he's loose and you're not going potty, if you want to increase your odds of him coming prior to us fixing this, all right, then you can use food and this is how you would do it. Informal commands would be, come, come on, let's go. Ollie is his name. That's just a choice. It's like, come hang out with me, but he's containing your backyard. So if he doesn't come, no harm, no foul, because at least he's safe. He's not going to get hit by a car. He's not going to run away and get lost, right? But informal commands are a choice. But if you're going to start to implement food to increase your odds of him coming, I would use the word here, and I would never lie to him. That means you never do not have a treat. But anytime you are using food, you are completely reliant on the dog's desire for what you have to offer him. So the reliability of your, I'm going to say it again, the reliability of your obedience, if you're using food as your only tool, the reliability of your obedience is reliant on the dog's desire for what you have to offer him. And if he doesn't want the food, he's going to run and do whatever he wants to do. I have a less than three month old puppy and I went to the beach and he has incredible food drive. And so if I said here, up until that point, I went to the beach, he'd been 100% consistent. So I felt very confident with, with the circumstances that I could have him off leash at the beach. And I also can chase him down at this point. That was the qualifier for me because you might be extremely agile, but I doubt you're going to chase this little guy down, right? Okay, so therefore that's not an option for you. But I'd been using here for two days on the beach and it was great until he found the crab shell. And once he found that crab shell, he grabbed that thing up and he ran with it. And I'm like, here, here, here. And he's like, no way. And he took off. And he laid down to eat it. Well, I stopped staying here, and I ran up to my pup, and I got the crab shell, and then, and then we just went on our way. But the point is, is that he's four months old, almost four months old. He already showed me. I'll come when I want to, but I already knew that. So now, once he gets older, I'm going to use other means to make him come. Now I can use a long line as well to help implement a 15, 20-foot line. If he has a line on him, I say here and he doesn't come, I can get to the end of that line, give a leash correction or direction. He comes to me and then I can reward with food or praise. But food is a band-aid in an enclosed safe environment for you, for this dog. But you'll never fix it without using an e-collar. Okay. An e-collar is a tool that we can, we'll do a whole other lesson if you would choose to do that and you like to do that. And we'll talk about what that looks like. But an e-collar is nothing but a TENS unit. And, and using it professionally, and if you don't know how to do this, this is why um, I do these, this differently because I'm very much involved. Because anytime you start to use other equipment, you want the help of a professional to make sure, because the most important thing to your dog is that we're fair. Because nothing is his fault. None of his behavior is his fault. He's driven by instinct. Humans are driven by intellect. 
And the fact is, is that everything he does, he thinks that it's okay because it's been a green light up and until. Jumping on us or jumping on humans was a green light up until today when you started to establish a boundary. Running away is a green light. And it doesn't matter how the human acts once they finally caught him prior to coming to you. But the fact is, is that we want to change the rules on him. And when you're using certain types of equipment or techniques, you really want the help of a professional to make sure that we are fair to the dog. Because we want a happy dog, but we want reliability and the obedience. And that's how my philosophy is about anything that we're using. Okay? Let's talk about the walk and create structure so you can start to have that leadership. Okay. Because in order to fix some of the, the dynamics of this pup, we have to look at all things. Even though you didn't come to me for me to fix the walk, but you did come to me because you want to fix some of your leadership issues. Well, everything affects everything because as a leader, you have to disagree with disrespect. And, and I have to also teach you what disrespect in the dog world looks like. Okay, because we don't. Because I bet you when he put his little feet on you and he was looking for affection or attention, Humans don't see that as disrespect. They see that as cute. Did you notice that as disrespect? Or did you? No. no? no? Okay. So then the human pets it. And they don't even realize they are praising disrespect. And then we're surprised when we tell the dog no. And he comes back and goes, you don't have a right. He never told me no in my life. And now he's going to come back. Because if you were a dog, he would have come back. My puppy can, can do something that I'm going to disagree with. And I'll touch him in the side and tell him off or whatever it might be. And I, can, I might have to touch him four or five times because he's super bold puppy, sometimes higher drive. So I might have to touch him four or five times and for him to respect my space. My dog and a dog in the house, my puppy went too close while he was laying down because remember I said space is a big deal? My, pup, my, my Rottweiler didn't even connect, but he went Bruh! And that puppy went all the way across the room and sat respectful and watched. And I was like, he was believable. He, there was no negotiation when it comes to leadership. My Rottweiler established a boundary, and that day forward, my, my puppy is not afraid of my Rottweiler. My puppy is very respectful. But what I did, you know, what I might touch four or five times, finding the level that he's going to respect so he chooses to avoid my, ch my touch, my Rottweiler said it, and my, and my puppy was respectful. And so dogs will teach you. If you really learn to observe dog behavior, they will teach you as a human how to be. And that's what I want to teach you. When we're talking about the walk, the reason the walk is important is because if, is, if he's pulling out in front, that is disrespectful if you're the leader. That means he's the leader and you're the follower. We want to switch. We want to change that. You're the leader and he's the follower. Well, when, you're, when a dog is wearing a harness, now there are times when a harness is very appropriate. But in this situation, it is not, in my opinion. Because the leash is a tool for you to communicate. And it does not allow you to give a leash correction or direction to disagree with anything because he's all set and harnesses were designed for pulling. So when I did protection work, I put a harness on my dog when I wanted him to be his biggest, strongest, baddest. I wanted to give pack support because he had a harness, but I wanted him not focused on me. I wanted him focused on the bad guy or the helper or whoever when we were doing protection work, he was going to go bite. So when I wanted to eliminate myself from the equation as much as possible, but still maintain the control, I had a harness. Well, we want leadership here, so my recommendation is we aren't going to use a harness. We can either use a flat collar or we can use a pinch collar. The pinch collar, used correctly, is a very, very safe tool. The dog never wears it unsupervised. He's never tied out with it. He never plays with another dog. It is for you on leash as a way to disagree if he starts to pull and how firm or gentle you need to be will be determined by the dog and his responsiveness. So I'm going to actually introduce that with your permission. I'm going to introduce that to him to get him walking at your side because this is why it's so important. Even though it's like, especially when you have a five or six pound dog that you have temperament issues with, you're like, I can manhandle him. I'm strong enough. It doesn't matter. But what matters is it's about the brain. It's about how they see you. And if you allow disrespect in one area out of a lack of knowledge or desire, then the dog sees you as weak. And then when you try to assert yourself over here, even with correct technique, they're like, you're not believable because over here you are weak. Leadership is who you are when you walk in the room. It is consistent. And they know what they're looking at if you're a leader or you're not. So what I, what I want to do is I want to eliminate those places in your relationship with him that you are undermining your authority and leadership out of a lack of knowledge to where we can have him rein in you know, and, and 
and then and then he doesn't come back and think he can be aggressive. I don't allow aggression in my pack. Knock it off. That's what we want. So he confidently can go through life following you, your rules. So what we're going to do is um, here's the little pinch collar that we're going to use. And again, um, I'll go ahead and put this on him. And we, uh, you know, we want to make sure it's, it's applied properly and it goes on the highest part of his neck. And then I'm going to go ahead and put it right behind his ears. And then with your permission, I'm going to go out there and we're going to, I'm going to start walking him and I'm going to teach him to walk at your side. Okay. And that's how we'll end our lesson. And then, um, if, and then if, if you would like to do any further lessons, yes. we will get those scheduled and we'll yes. talk about what it'll take to get him completely safely reined in with rules, boundaries, and discipline to where he can have a lot of freedom. You can run on the beach with this guy. And, but you can't do it today because you might keep on going, yeah. right? But I'm telling you what, I think every pet dog owner should experience the freedom of allowing their dog to run and just be completely free and also have the peace of mind of knowing they're gonna come back and they'll be safe. Because yeah. that's our responsibility. And I, I, it's just an incredible experience. So let me just invite this little guy in and see if he'll come. He may not, and if he doesn't wanna come in, it's not because he's afraid, it's because there's so much respect and I don't have a relationship with him. And so he just like, nope, I'm good. It's kind of like my Rottweiler with my lab or my little pup. You know what I mean? So Ollie, Ollie, come on, little one. Now I'm inviting you into my space. See, I can pet him now. It's not, a, so when he respected my space, it wasn't about fear. It was about respect. So he comes in. I'm just going to go ahead and put this on him. Hi, right, buddy. Now this sits comfortably on his neck. It's. There's space, so I want you to see there's space. Okay. It's not digging in. I'm going to be a very gentle human bungee as I start to teach him the boundaries of this, okay, okay and get him following me. And his little brain is going to have to learn to follow. So there might be a little bit of protest. There might be a little bit of frustration as he's figuring it out, but I'm going to be incredibly gentle showing him. You can never correct a dog for something they don't understand. This is not about correction. This is about finding a tool that will help me establish structure. Um, so he's walking at your side, okay? And so um, anyway, so I'm gonna go ahead and get him set up for that. So for today's rough recap, number one, when you're bringing a dog home for the first time, it is so important that you disagree with disrespect and they are very clear on what the rules, boundaries, and discipline are in your home. You wanna make sure that that relationship that you have with your dog is set on good footing from the very beginning. If you're using food for your hear command, you have to realize that the consistency of your obedience is reliant on the dog's desire for what you have to offer him. So food is nothing more than incentive. So always make sure your dog is in a safe environment when you're using food. And please remember, this is part two of a three video series or a three lesson series. Please watch number one and number three so you can get Ollie and Tracy's full story. Thank you very much and have a great day. Till the next lesson, we just thank you so much for listening. We hope you gained some value. And again, your dog will never be what you want him to be until you're the leader they need you to be. And we just thank you for your time and we'll see you next time.